Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll just give like two minutes for a couple of people to join us, then we start. Ok, bien entendu. <laughs> So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dr. Carolina Gemma from the JPAIGO operation based out of Nairobi office. I'll be your moderator for today. And for me today, I'm really excited in the conversations we're going to have because we'll be looking at how gender equality and health for all really is a must for us as we plan for various interventions in the future. In the prime opportunity as we lead up to the summit, the future opportunity that we are looking out for in 2024 conversations on behalf of women in global health, Amrit Health Africa and Force Feminista. I'm really pleased to have you join us today for this discussion on advancing sexual and reproductive health rights through gender rep responsive health systems to mark the United Nations Civil Society Conference that is taking place in Nairobi this week. And I would just like to give us some brief insights on how we will conduct ourselves today as we deliberate. Kindly have yourself introduced within the chat, put your name where you're coming from, and also contribute to the discussions. And what are some of the learning points you can pick from your experiences and how we can further this conversation. We are keen to learn about your perspectives, some of the good practices you've had, strength and collaboration and solidarity among us all, with a key end in mind, being able to have gender responsive health systems in place. So please feel welcome and make yourself feel at home from wherever is it you're joining us today. We have French and Spanish interpretation available on this webinar. You can click on the globe symbol on your screens to access the interpretation. So allow me now to invite Dr. Shabdam, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Women in Global Health to deliver our opening presentation. Welcome, Dr. Shabdam. Thank you so much, thank you. Uh, can we have the slides on? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much and welcome once again, everyone. We are deli delighted to see so many of you join us today as we tackle an immensely important topic, the future, and specifically how we ensure that the health needs of women, girls, and other marginalized groups are at the forefront of this future. I want to express deep gratitude to our co-sponsors, AMREF Health Africa and FOSS Feminista, steadfast partners in our ongoing advocacy for improved health systems and gender equality. FOSS Feminista in particular has been a key ally in our campaign to prevent and combat sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. Universal health coverage for all. So we are going to be looking can I have the next slide? Thank you. Can, yeah, so we will be looking towards the future of gender equality and universal health coverage. In September 2023, during the United Nations General Assembly, member states convened at the second high level meeting on universal health coverage, reaffirming their commitment to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. However, a stark reality emerged that same year when the World Health Organization delivered sobering findings. Next slide. The world is currently off track to meet the universal health coverage target by 2030, exacerbated by the pandemic, which has set us back significantly. Shockingly, 4.5 billion people still lack coverage for essential health services, and approximately 2 billion people face financial hardship due to health expenses. We know that primary healthcare-driven UHC interventions have the power to save millions of lives. But here's where the statistics unveil profound disparities rooted not in biology alone, but in societal constructs. The differences in health risk, disease prevalence, and outcomes between women and men cannot be solely attributed to physiological variances. The answers lie in gender. Gender distinct from biological sex is a pivotal determinant of health. Gender inequalities perpetuate disparities in health outcomes and hinder access to services. Gender norms, roles, power differentials, and resource con 
control contributes significantly to vulnerabilities, health behaviors, and treatment responses. Let's confront the troubling realities. Women and adolescent girls globally are dying from preventable causes during pregnancy, childbirth, and unsafe abortions robbed of autonomy over their health decisions. Shockingly, 225 million women lack access to contraception, leading to millions of unintended pregnancies annually. Each year, approximately 3 million girls aged 15 to 19 undergo unsafe abortions. The impact isn't solely on women. Men too face challenges evident in the fact that life expectancy for men is consistently lower than that for women in every country. Despite the glaring evidence, UHC 2030's latest State of UHC Commitment Review paints a disappointing picture. UHC processes remain gender blind with a continued lack of commitment to enhancing women's representation in health and political leadership. Women who comprise 67% of the global health and care workforce, yet they often find themselves in low status roles with reduced pay or no pay at all. Shockingly, they hold only 25% of senior decision-making positions in the health sector. And in a country where I come from, Pakistan, it's less than 5%. This must change. Our commitment to UHC cannot be truly universal if it does not address the gender inequities that undermine health systems and impede progress towards achieving health for all. It's time to bridge these gaps, amplify women's voices, and empower gender-inclusive health systems that leaves no one behind. Together, let's drive the transformation needed for a future where health truly knows no gender. Today's pivotal gathering is marking the UN Civil Society Conference here in Nairobi. This conference serves as a crucial stepping stone leading up to the summit of the future and its consequential outcomes, the Pact for the Future scheduled for September at the United Nations General Assembly. However, as we examine the zero draft of this pact released earlier this year, a glaring absence strikes us all. Health, universal health coverage is notably absent, and the current draft falls short on addressing critical issues of gender equality. Sexual and reproductive rights mentioned only once and not within a broader rights framework demand comprehensive inclusion. Furthermore, the pact overlooks the complex realities of intersectionality failing to acknowledge how certain groups face compounded disadvantages due to factors such as age, sex, race, ethnicity, class, or gender. Equally concerning is the silence on the necessity of collaborative and coalition building with civil society organizations for sustainable development. It is disappointing that civil society cannot observe member state negotiations of the pact undermining transparency and meaningful engagement. Our feedback and consultations as civil society are not merely ceremonial. They are indeed imperative. This conference in Nairobi provides a vital platform for our voices to be heard, urging member states to uphold their commitment and incorporates our insights into the pact for the future. Together, let us seize this opportunity to advocate for a more inclusive, right-based and health-focused path that leaves no one behind. Our collective action is indispensable in shaping future where aspirations of all are realized. Can I have the next slide? Member States' commitments on UHC. In 2015, Member States committed to achieving universal health coverage as part of their pledge to Sustainable Development Goal 3. The commitment was reaffirmed in 2019 political declaration on UHC. However, in the four years since the 2019 high-level meeting, the landscape for UHC has undergone profound changes. The COVID-19 pandemic has widened existing inequality gaps including gender disparities and set back progress towards sustainable development. Next slide. In September 2023, political leaders once again reaffirmed their dedication to achieving UHC by the SDG target of 2030, a UHC that is not only accessible and equitable, but also gender, race, and age responsive. Member states have recognized that gender equality is not only pivotal, 
for UHC, but that UHC in turn empowers women and girls, bolsters gender equality, fuels development, drives economies, and fosters healthier, more peaceful, and inclusive societies. Essential services are the foundation of universal health coverage, and it is imperative that services across the life course, particularly those supporting marginalized populations, receive the spotlight and adequate resources. Unfortunately, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we witnessed essential services, such as those providing sexual and reproductive health and rights, being reduced or defunded as governments face tough decisions with health budgets. It is time to translate commitments into action, ensuring that no one is left behind in our pursuit of universal health coverage that is not only inclusive, but transformative. Together, let us advocate for a future where every individual, regardless of gender, race, or age, can access the quality of services they need and they deserve. Next slide. So let's touch upon the gender responsive universal health coverage and the key messages that we have for the summit. Firstly, health is an indisputable universal human right, fundamental to human well-being, thriving economies, and peaceful societies. The pandemic has inflicted devastating blows on health systems and economies, exacerbating inequality within and among nations, including alarming gender disparities. As we rebuild societies, economies, and health systems, we must center the rights of women and girls and uphold gender equality as the guiding principle rooted in numerous commitments made by member states. Health for all must remain our overarching ambition as we plan for the future. Secondly, gender equality is paramount in global health where women constitute 70% of the health workforce, but hold only 25% of senior leadership positions, women health and care workers are disproportionately con concentrated in lower status, lower paid roles, earning 24% less than their male counterparts. Women in global health advocates for health leaders, regardless of gender, to be transformative leaders addressing gender inequities head on, ensuring gender equality is essential for sustaining and improving health services and universal access to healthcare. Our third message is gender, regarding gender responsive health systems and universal health coverage, they are imperative for the future and the summit of the future must underscore the SDG commitment to universal health coverage and prioritize it in collective global actions. Governments must design adequately resource and deliver health system based on gender responsive policies and services, thereby eradicating gender inequality and discrimination. Fourthly, women in global health is deeply concerned about the rapid and widespread campaign to roll back women's rights and gender equality in health, including sexual and reproductive health rights. Progress towards all SDGs, particularly women's rights and gender equality, is jeopardized by these challenges to fundamental rights, we must steadfastly defend these rights. And lastly, the climate change conflicts and economic setbacks pose significant threats to health systems, leaving vulnerable countries struggling to invest in social welfare and meet the health needs. Multilateralism is indispensable for a coordinated response that recognizes the differential impact on women, girls, and vulnerable populations, safeguarding the gains made in healthcare and social welfare. Together, let us champion these key messages and advocate for a future where health is truly equitable, inclusive, and transformative for all. In this digital space, Despite our physical distance, we are united by a shared vision and commitment. Together, let's explore and shape a future where health equity is not a privilege, but a universal reality. To conclude, universal health coverage is truly universal only when it reaches everyone, everywhere, including the most vulnerable and marginalized. As we look towards the future, it is imperative to integrate a gender lens into all aspects of health systems, governance, design, financing, and service delivery. 
It is this holistic approach which is essential to achieving universal health coverage and ensuring health for all addressing deep-seated inequities. Let us advocate for a future led by her health, equity, and rights. Thank you all for being here, and let's ensure that our dialogue today is impactful and transformative, paving the way for a world where health is a right, not a privilege. Together, we can make this vision a reality. Thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shabnam. Indeed, health is a right, not a privilege. And there are investments we need to continue making as stakeholders within this space to ensure that everyone really has access, not only to health, but quality health. So over to us now, we're having a team of four panelists that will bring to us insights from different parts of this world to shed light on what has been done, what are the, the commitments that have been made by different governments, and what do we still need to do to ensure that we are able to make this a reality. So allow me to introduce our panelists to us this afternoon. Margaret Odera, who is one of our panelists today, she's a community health worker, a mental mother who operates in one of the slums within Nairobi area, that is Madare North Health Center, in her neighborhood where she follows up on pregnant and lactating mothers to ensure the babies are HIV negative at 18 months. Margaret is also a CHW advocate and her objective really is to see professionalized, salaried, equipped and trained community health workers. And in the process, she's been able to form a network of CHWs to unite them together for the purpose of advocating for their needs and also ensuring that they have a voice to, uh, to, to speak towards in this country. In 2022, Margaret was selected as the Women in Global Health Heroines of Health Award. Congratulations, Margaret. And also take this moment to introduce Dr. Elise, who will be speaking to us today in French, and she's a public health doctor. Currently, she's the director of the Institutional Development and Innovation in the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso. She works on strengthening the health systems. She also has expertise in the field of sexual and reproductive health, as she was in charge of the Reproductive Health and Family Program in the Family Health Directorate in the Ministry of Health for six years. Glad to have you, Dr. Elise. We also have with us Ms. Maas, who is the executive director of Hubspeed Foundation in Argentina. She's worked in different NGOs in Spain, Bolivia and Argentina, as well as in public agencies, focusing her work in areas such as childhood in situations of homeless, looking at those that are deprived of freedom, victims of violence, persons that are abused by persons in positions of authority, people that are infected and affected by HIV AIDS, and she will be speaking to us today in Spanish. Finally, we have Dr. Shivangi, who is a medical doctor and a public health researcher. She engages in research and advocacy on issues around nutrition, healthcare access, healthcare worker rights, women's health, youth and adolescent health, occupational health, effects of climate change on individuals' health outcomes. She also does work around emergency care and, men and mental health. So these are the great team of panelists that we have today. So I'll start off with Dr. Elise. Could you kindly just shed light, following the high level meeting that was held in 2023, we had member states make various commitments towards designing health policies and ensuring that services are health responsive. What has been Burkina Faso's plans to prioritize these commitments? And how would you say that civil society organizations can engage with this process? Over to you, Dr. Ellis. Okay, merci. Merci, Dr. pour la parole donnée. Et en tout cas, merci de nous avoir pris en compte Women in Global Health Burkina Faso pour ce, ce webinaire. Et comme vous l'avez dit tantôt, je suis Dr. Elise Djengere, je suis du ministère de la Santé du Burkina Faso. Et donc, euh, par rapport euh, à la question, à la thématique du jour, je m'en vais euh, donner un peu les engagements que le gouvernement du Burkina Faso a pris pour pouvoir, en quelque sorte, donner la priorité des engagements en matière de, de genre. Il faut se dire qu'au niveau du Burkina Faso, nous avons, euh, depuis 2020, 
Et bien avant cela, euh, mis en place une stratégie nationale du genre qui couvrait la période 2020-2024 et dans le cadre de la politique nationale genre. Et chaque secteur euh, ministériel est tenu de tenir compte des orientations qui sont prévues dans ce, cette stratégie nationale et dans la mise en œuvre de leurs actions. Et donc, euh, dans ce cadre, plus précisément pour ce qui concerne le ministère de la Santé, euh, il y a un certain nombre de réformes que nous avons mises en place qui permettent de renforcer en quelque sorte les engagements qui sont pris dans ce sens. Et parmi ces réformes, euh, je peux euh, citer entre autres il y a euh, la mise en application des tarifs. Nous avons mis en place en tout cas des tarifs qui sont accessibles à tous, à toutes les couches sociales, euh, à travers le paquet de soins de gratuité, dont les cibles sont les femmes et les enfants de moins de 5 ans. Donc, pour, tout ce, pour, pour ces cibles, les interventions, les prises en charge, en tout cas, sont gratuites. Il y a également, euh, toujours dans le cadre de ce paquet de gratuité, nous, il a été introduit tout, introduit tout récemment la radiothérapie et la coronarographie dans ce paquet de gratuité pour rendre accessible justement ces interventions à la population et surtout aux, aux femmes qui sont beaucoup plus euh, euh, touchés par euh, les questions du cancer euh, du col de l'utérus, le cancer du sein. Et donc, ces mesures, en tout cas, favorisent l'accès des, des femmes à ces, à ces interventions. À cela, on peut ajouter également la prise en compte des, des PVVIH, des personnes vivant avec le VIH, dans cette stratégie de gratuité des soins. Il y a eu également, tout récemment, euh, une mesure qui a permis de réduire les tarifs de facturation pour ce qui concerne l'IRM, le scanner et la dialyse, qui sont vraiment, qui étaient des interventions qui coûtaient très cher et qui n'étaient pas vraiment accessibles pour... Euh, euh, la grande majorité de la population. Et cette mesure vraiment permet de rendre accessible euh, ces interventions à une grande majorité. À cela s'ajoute la gratuité totale pour la planification familiale. Il faut se dire que depuis un, un certain nombre d'années, euh, les produits de planification familiale sont gratuits, sont mis en en, 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 sont mis à la disposition gratuitement à la population, et surtout la frange, euh, euh, les femmes, les jeunes, les adolescents qui en ont besoin. Il faut également euh, évo évoquer la prise en charge des fistules obstétricales, qui est un mal, euh, en tout cas, qui concerne pas mal de de population, surtout les, les femmes, les jeunes femmes du milieu rural qui sont victimes de ce, de ce problème. Et la prise en charge de ces fissures sont également gratuites. À cela s'ajoute le dépistage des lésions précancéreuses du col et la, et la vaccination, la vaccination pour les enfants de moins de 5 ans et les femmes en âge de procréer. Il faut se dire qu'actuellement, il y a une réflexion qui est en cours pour prendre en compte les personnes âgées dans cette stratégie de gratuité des soins, les albinos et également certains médicaments d'intérêt comme les antirétroviraux qui se rentrent en ligne de compte dans la prise en charge des cancers, dont les cancers du col, cancer du sein qui touche beaucoup plus les femmes. Et également, il y a l'IDEA contre la drépanocytose et les, les médicaments qui luttent contre le diabète et l'hypertension artérielle. 
Maintenant, en matière de protection sociale en santé, au niveau du Burkina Faso, un regard particulier est fait pour les groupes vulnérables, ce qui permet de prendre en compte le genre. Et cette année, en 2024, il y a eu en tout cas un certain nombre de mesures qui ont été mises en place pour pouvoir euh, favoriser une plus large accessibilité des populations vulnérables à certaines actions, à certaines interventions. Je peux citer euh, par là, par exemple, la prise en charge de l'insuffisance rénale, qui constitue en tout cas une pathologie qui est en recrudescence dans notre communauté, mais dont le coût, la prise en charge était vraiment élevée. Et donc, euh, ce n'est pas tout le monde qui pouvait vraiment y accéder. Donc, il y a des mesures qui ont été prises tout récemment pour réduire les tarifs de prise en charge de cette pathologie. Il y a également une mesure euh, pour la mise en place d'une assurance maladie euh, qui est en cours de mise en œuvre et qui va permettre à, aux citoyens lambda burkinabé de pouvoir se faire soigner, prendre en charge à tout moment, même lorsqu'il n'a pas, en tout cas, euh, les moyens financiers à sa disposition, tant qu'il est euh, affilié à cette assurance maladie. Et donc, c'est un processus qui est en cours actuellement et qui va vraiment soulager, un tant soit peu, euh, la contribution, en tout cas le poids, euh, la contribution de la population pour la, leur prise en charge. En plus de la stratégie nationale genre, il y a la politique de la promotion de la femme et du genre qui est mise en œuvre et qui permet dans les autres secteurs tels que l'éducation et même dans le domaine de la politique de prendre en compte en tout cas la contribution de la femme. Pour, il y a, dans ce cadre, on parle du quota genre, que ce soit au niveau de l'éducation pour le recrutement des élèves au niveau du secondaire, du primaire et même du supérieur. Et il y a également au niveau, dans toutes les instances, il y a un regard particulier qui est un accent qui est mis sur la contribution, l'implication et la prise en compte des femmes pour justement leur permettre de, de contribuer dans la prise des décisions au niveau des sphères décisionnelles. Thank you so much, Dr. Elise. Oui, oui. Thank you, Dr. Elise. We'll definitely come back to hear more of the wonderful work you're doing in uh, Okina. So allow us now to listen in to Margaret. Margaret, kindly just shed some light on what are some of the challenges that remain in delivering sexual and reproductive health care to marginalized and vulnerable groups. Okay, thank you so much. It's such an honor for a community health worker to be given this an opportunity to be here. And uh, as a community health worker who is a woman, I really feel very much honored. The main challenges in delivering sexual health, reproductive health care to vulnerable and marginalized population in Kenya. Number one, gender leadership imbalance has a direct impact to, the, to, to providing this health care. The art of, of giving women leadership position is advancing at the pace of a snail, if not, if not being downplayed. This has a, a direct negative impact, even to, to give this, uh, to, to deliver this service among women and girls. Culture norms. In some culture, it is a taboo to speak about sexual reproductive health, let alone delivering services. But if we give women in our community leadership opportunities, this kind of, of, of culture is going to diminish with time. Illiteracy. Most of the information nowadays are transmitted electronically. Most of these vulnerable groups cannot access information due to poverty. Uh, let, let me talk about climate change. It is difficult to reach people from affected places. Right now, we have flooding in Kenya. 
reaching people uh, in places which have been which are flooded has been very very difficult and this has brought a negative impact in sexual reproductive uh, service delivery culture and religion and religious beliefs has made it impossible for community to accept services in the hospitals now all this uh, disadvantages and challenges can be addressed first of all one of the one of the main issues that can be addressed is giving women leadership if a woman is women are given leadership positions in our communities these cultures are going to be changed because women are going to influence these cultures to be changed and we are going to have a positive impact in this example is fighting female genital mutilation in kenya most of the of the of our our leaders in the in our communities are men therefore fighting female genital mutilation cannot stop cannot cannot be cannot be achieved 100% if women will not be given leadership chances to address these issues as leaders and, the, and, and therefore they are going to be given power even to change this uh, kind of cultures that have a direct negative impact in a woman's health. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for shedding light on how vulnerable people in different contexts are and even how climate change is really impacting on some of the gains that have been made so far. So we'll go to Dr. Shivangi, looking at just carrying on from where Margaret has stopped. How can youth and other marginalized populations be actively involved in shaping and implementing the gender responsive health systems, especially looking at inclusivity and responsiveness to their needs? Thank you. Um, so when I speak, uh, for the youth or when I talk about uh, marginalized sections, one thing that I want to point out, especially because we are a group of, and largely most of us are women who identify as I said, largely, of course, that's um, a generalization. But I think one thing I want to bring about, uh, bring up is how we build solidarity. So for all uh, youth and marginalized populations, I think that's one thing that we need to keep in mind, even as we build our movements and even as we try to engage with governments and other sections of civil society and uh, other, uh, as we try to form alliances. Because as we talk about uh, SRHR, we tend to limit a lot of the conversation to women's health and when we use women, it gets, uh, you know, limited to a dichotomous, uh, you know, just a limited binary. Um, so I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, that we are advocates not only for ourselves, whatever our gender identity may be, um, but also to look at it in the larger frame of things where others are also struggling with, uh, you know, uh, their uh, rights around uh, sexual and uh, reproductive rights. Another thing I wanted to point out, again, uh, taking off from the solidarity point of view itself, that as young people, when we start engaging, it is important to look at the interconnectedness of issues. SRHR issues do not arise in a vacuum. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of, so in India, for instance, there's a program called RKSK. Which looks uh, which engages peer educators and uh, ad adolescents basically, um, and I remember there was a session last year, a G20 event where uh, one of the peer educators from a, a village uh, had pointed out while everyone was making statements about uh, you know your teacher helping you with uh, menstrual hygiene, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even basic things like the teacher is not present at all. So when there's that kind of dearth. So those are things also that we need to keep in mind while we are advocating for one issue. It's important to, again, uh, keep other movements alongside and, uh, you know, engage with those as well. Um, the third thing that, I again, uh, to do with interconnectedness itself, um, food rights. Um, I know about my country, that's something that, again, puts women and other, you know, sexual and gender minorities basically at risk. Uh, when you are food insecure, you uh, you are vulnerable. Um, and similarly, you know, you have uh, employment issues and you have caste. So all of these, so as 
a youth and uh, uh, you know as somebody who is you know early in her career and was trying to connect with different movements i would say it's important to not limit ourselves to one um, you know sort of uh, silo uh, when we are trying to advocate for something because all of these issues are connected and while it is important to advocate for women it's important to also remember that we belong uh, that you know there is a connectedness we need to advocate not only for women and we need to be able to fight with others even as conflicts are going on it's important that we don't forget that there are women uh, in philistine who are still uh, you know delivering without uh, water i mean there are babies and women dying um i think it's important to not advocate only for one thing while we are um, you know sort of whether conveniently or with guilt um sidelining a few things so i think as advocates and as someone who is still in the formative phase of uh, advocacy myself i would say it's important to find um, communities and uh, movements and alliances where we can be as inclusive as possible in our advocacy thank you thank you so much for speaking a lot around coalition building and even just looking at different avenues of bringing different voices into this space miss ma allow me to reach out to you this afternoon just to find out how do we address the gender disparities in accessing healthcare especially around sexual reproductive health rights Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Eh, en primer lugar, por invitarnos eh, a contar la experiencia de Latinoamérica y, y el Caribe desde Fundación Huesped. Eh, venimos trabajando hace eh, 35 años en estas temáticas en la región y bueno, también quería agradecer especialmente que tengan la traducción al español, que eso facilita a, a muchas personas de nuestra región acceder a, a estas discusiones tan importantes. Eh, voy a tratar de, de traer el, eh, acá la, la, la experiencia de, eh, de, de cinco aspectos que me parece eh, importante eh, destacar a la hora de pensar cómo estos, eh, los sistemas sanitarios podrían eh, eh, realmente hacer accesibles los derechos sexuales y reproductivos. Por un lado, me parece que la flexibilidad del sistema sanitario para dar cuenta de las diferencias en, en las disparidades de, de acceso para las identidades de género es necesario. No, no todas las poblaciones tienen las mismas dificultades de acceso. En ese sentido, eh, poder pensar en que eh, la interseccionalidad eh, eh, sea tenida en cuenta desde la planificación de los sistemas, en la implementación y en la evaluación posterior, contando con las comunidades más afectadas, eh, desde mujeres, niñas, ancianas eh, que están en áreas rurales, eh, personas trans, trabajadoras sexuales, personas privadas de la libertad, y toda la comunidad LGBTI eh, es necesario tenerlas en cuenta dentro de la planificación eh, eh, con la flexibilidad ne necesaria. En segundo lugar, eh, me parece que la, la posibilidad de que eh, el sistema de salud no solo espere que la población llegue, sino que el sistema salga a buscar la población. Aquella que van a tener más dificultades, el sistema puede salir y así, a, eh, ahí, ahí está claramente demostrado que cuando el sistema sale, por ejemplo, en, en lo que tiene que ver con el testeo de VIH, hepatitis eh, y otras infecciones de transmisión sexual, es mucho más efectivo que si el sistema solo espera que la población llegue. Creo que este es un, un diferencial importante. Por otro lado, eh, que, que los agentes sanitarios tengan la capacitación necesaria en todos los procesos y procedimientos de afirmación de género eh, para que las poblaciones y sobre todo las identidades eh, sexuales puedan sentir que tienen acceso sin discriminación. Bueno, esto, esto también ha sido demostrado como un factor eh, necesario. 
En cuarto lugar, eh, poder eh, eh, ver cuál es la consulta de salud más prioritaria para algunas de estas poblaciones. Por ejemplo, eh, eh, para muchas mujeres la consulta anual es la ginecológica. Entonces, si podemos ahí... Eh, trabajar para que esa consulta tenga una visión holística y, e integral de la salud, porque va a ser tal vez la única oportunidad en la que vamos a encontrarnos con esa mujer, eh, tenemos que aprovecharla. Tal vez es la consulta pediátrica, porque van a la consulta por los hijos, entonces es ahí donde habría que concentrar eh, la propuesta holística de salud. O en poblaciones eh, como la población trans, eh, esa consulta prioritaria es la consulta por la hormonización. Entonces, aprovechar ese momento y no esperar que las personas vengan tres, cuatro, cinco veces eh, al, al espacio de salud, eh, porque eh, la dificultad de acceso hace que eso a lo mejor sea imposible. Eso me parece que también puede ser un aspecto importante. Y por último, eh, desde la experiencia en, en Argentina y en Latinoamérica, eh, necesitamos un compromiso de política pública a largo plazo. Eh, políticas públicas que además cuenten con presupuestos garantizados para poder llevarse adelante. Los cambios eh, de gobierno que tiran atrás toda la política pública anterior y hay que iniciar nuevamente eh, de cero eh, cada... Eh, políticas sin tener una continuidad eh, no, nos hacen que eh, retrocedamos eh, en cada elección eh, muchos pasos atrás. Entonces, un compromiso que sea a largo plazo con la salud y que, sea, eh, que no dependa del partido de turno, del gobierno de turno, eso sería realmente importante. Muchas gracias por la escucha. Thank you so much, Ms. May. I love the point when you say the health system should be responsive and reach out to individuals where they are at. So at this point, I'll just allow for two questions from the audience. Kindly let us know who you're directing your question to so that then we can listen in to uh, the reflections from our team. Anyone? Feel free to unmute and uh, ask your question. Okay, we have one question in the Q&A. Um, what are the main challenges and opportunities in advocating for the inclusion of gender responsive UHC in national health policies and plans? Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Do you want to speak a bit to that? Je n'ai pas saisi votre question, s'il vous plaît. Pouvez-vous reprendre? Vous m'entendez? Yes, I will repeat the question. What are the main challenges and opportunities in advocating for the advocate for the inclusion of gender responsibility in national health policies and plans? La traducción n'a pas suivi, hein? <laughs> Did this translation work? Oui, j'ai bien, bien noté. Quels sont les différentes, les pour les plaidoyers? Euh, bon, en ce qui concerne... Euh, Le Burkina Faso, il faut se dire que euh, le domaine du plaidoyer, je dirais, c'est vraiment l'apanage de, des organisations de la société civile. Parce que euh, c'est elles qui, en tout cas, qui, sont, qui peuvent engager, c'est leur... Euh, C'est leur, leur, leur j'allais dire, c'est leur, leur euh, cheval de bataille. Voilà, c'est surtout les, les organisations de la société, société civile qui jouent ce rôle dans le cadre du plaidoyer. 
à travers la communication pour le changement de comportement et puis également la sensibilisation des populations pour qu'ils puissent vraiment adhérer aux différentes réformes qui sont mises en place, également aussi pour qu'ils puissent, en tout cas, comprendre l'importance pour, leur, pour la promotion de la santé au sein des communautés. Également, ces organisations de la société civile ont pour rôle aussi de d'assurer la veille citoyenne dans l'application, en tout cas, des principes d'égalité, euh, d'équité, dans la mise en œuvre des différentes euh, stratégies et interventions, et de faire le plaidoyer aussi auprès euh, des, des gouvernants, des responsables, au cas où il y a, en tout cas, un manquement des insuffisances dans la mise en œuvre de, de tel ou tel domaine, pour qu'il y ait une opérationnalisation, en tout cas, au profit de la grande majorité. Bon, quand j'ai suivi, en tout cas, l'intervention des uns et des autres, je vois que les situations sont similaires hein, de part et d'autre. On parle de les populations marginalisées, euh, également, qu'on doit prendre en compte, en tout cas, dans le cadre du, du genre. Dans tout ce qui est mis en œuvre, effectivement, il faut également les impliquer pour une meilleure prise en compte de leurs préoccupations, de leurs problèmes. Donc, la société civile a un rôle à jouer dans ce sens-là aussi. Donc, voilà un peu ce que je peux dire par rapport à cette oui. question. Merci. Thank you so much, Dr. Liz Margaret. There is a question for you in the chat. Looking at sexual reproductive health education, there are challenges of engaging the youth. What would you say are some of the ways we can overcome this challenge other than just involving them as CHWs? All right. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm so glad that the youth are embracing the fact that they want to be uh, community health workers. And one thing I would, I would like to maybe to, to say is, is maybe we can encourage the young people to be community health workers, one, by empowering the community health workers who are working right now, giving them fair pay, training them and professionalizing them, will encourage these young people to come on board so that they may join in this, uh, in this participation of, uh, uh, of uh, delivering services in, in health. In health. Uh, one thing I would like to, to say, if if we are going to start from where we are, that the government will empower the community health workers who are on board right now. It will be an encouragement for young people out there who are looking for, for jobs, for careers. Let, let them see this as an example. And I think in this process, the young people are going to be encouraged even to deliver services uh, during this moment. And, uh, it will be easier because youth are our community members. They are part and parcel of our community and they are strong. Uh, we are aging gracefully. Uh, and this is a fact that, that the, the, the community health workers who are here are aging gracefully. And something that will encourage the people who are coming on board to work in health sector, given that now the health sector is, uh, the, the health, health workers, uh, we, we, have, we have a deficit at critical deficit of health workers in the country. If we start by empowering the, health, the community health workers and even uh, upgrading the health systems in Kenya, empowering even the doctors and the nurses, this will, 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 be, will, will show a positive uh, impact and it will, it will bring this to uh, youth out there to think and to know that health is something that is, is, a, is enjoyable if I can give my, my children who are going to be youth, young people in future, if they see me giving, uh, setting foods on the table, giving, being given important platforms like this, this is an encouragement to young people who are out there that they will, they will be able to be encouraged to come on board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. I'll now go to all our panelists. 
as we look ahead to the summit of the future, how do you envision the role of the CSOs in promoting UHC and better access to sexual and reproductive health rights for all? I'll start with you, Dr. Shivangi. What are your reflections as we look forward to this summit? I would actually first uh, start to echo what was just said because we face a similar thing in India. Community health workers in India also are the people who are leading this change and uh, would I think it is necessary to empower them everywhere across the world. So I think uh, empowering community health workers would be one of the first things that we should focus on. And it, it is obvious, uh, I, I, I can say for India and I know for a few other countries as well, that uh, these are uh, obviously very gendered and which is why, you know, that is another reason that uh, community health workers don't get their dues. So that's one of the first things that I would like to uh, raise when we talk about more responsive systems. The other thing that I want to raise is um, regarding social audit processes, because when we are talking about more responsive systems, I think that's one of the mechanisms that are weakening throughout the world where people don't get to, uh, you know, uh, put forth what uh, what is required in their respective local communities. So I think these are the two points that uh, are uh, important uh, right off the start. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Ma, any reflections on what we need to put into consideration as we look forward towards the summit? Oui, je voulais, uh, je voulais également uh, apporter uh, un peu l'expérience au niveau du Burkina par rapport à cette question du, du genre, une chose de l'accès, la question des droits, voilà, les droits sexuels et reproductifs. Il faut se dire que euh, cette question d'inégalité du genre se, se fait beaucoup plus ressentir dans nos contrées, surtout par rapport à la population jeune, la France jeune, les adolescents. Euh, les jeunes qui n'ont pas vraiment euh, accès à l'information, surtout, bon, quand bien même il y a pas mal d'efforts qui sont faits pour qu'ils puissent euh, y accéder, mais il y a toujours en tout cas des, effets, des défis dans ce sens-là. L'accès à l'information, l'accès également aussi aux services de santé sexuelle et reproductive, parce qu'il euh, y a beaucoup la question de, euh, de confidentialité euh, qui se pose. Il euh, y a la question aussi euh, de, 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 de des préjugés, oui, des préjugés par rapport euh, à, au fait que les jeunes fréquentent les services de santé pour pouvoir poser leurs problèmes de santé sexuelle et reproductive. Donc, ça, c'est encore des défis que, auxquels nous devons faire face parce que, bon, ce n'est pas toujours évident pour les jeunes de pouvoir avoir facilement accès aux services de santé sexuelle et reproductive. Et pour ne citer que cela, bon, peut-être s'il y a encore le temps, je pourrais revenir sur d'autres aspects. Merci. Thank you so much, Dr. Elise. Ms. Ma, allow me to come to you with two questions. Just give some insights on how we can use the hospital data to address some of these social dynamic determinants around health outcomes, and then your reflections going forward as we approach the summit. Did uh, the translators get me? Uh, bon, je n'ai pas bien saisi. No, no, Dr. Ellis, we are oui. asking. Hello. Oui. We are speaking to Miss Ma. Oui. Miss, Miss Ma? Si. Yes. Kindly just shed some light on how we can use hospital administrative data to address some of these maternal health outcomes that we are seeing in our facilities and your parting shot as we approach the summit. Okay. 
Eh, Al fin. bueno, hay, hay, por lo menos en, en Latinoamérica, hay todo un desafío en relación al uso de datos y el uso de historia clínica electrónica y, bueno, como decía la doctora Liz, eh, en la confidencialidad respecto al uso de estos datos. Eh, ahí me parece que hay un punto importante, por lo menos en, en nuestra región eh, y creo que es global, en relación a la población migrante y el acceso a la salud y eh, cómo sus datos y sus datos clínicos van pasando de un país a otro. Esto es todo un desafío, por lo menos eh, en, en nuestra región, muy importante de seguridad de los datos eh, que, nos, que nos hace pensar en eh, al, algunas poblaciones en concreto que, que, van, hay que, eh, que, que suponen un desafío eh, para la innovación y para la, la, el, el trabajo en relación a cómo poder garantizar, por ejemplo, la continuidad de los tratamientos cuando las personas eh, migran. Eh, y quería hacer, un, un, en ese sentido, un, una mención a la, una experiencia que me parece importante eh, en relación a cómo mejorar el acceso a los espacios de salud, que es el rol de, eh, nosotros le llamamos navegadoras pares, navegadores pares, es decir, eh, personas de las propias comunidades que facilitan el acceso y la retención en el sistema de salud, que ayudan a entender todos los pasos administrativos y burocráticos que a veces hacen que bueno, toda esa eh, exigencia de información y de datos y de documentación que hay para acceder al sistema de salud hagan que bueno, muchas personas desistan de volver al sistema y ahí el navegador PAR eh, realmente es un rol clave para tener en cuenta en el sistema de salud del futuro eh, que facilite el, el acceso. Thank, thank you so, so much. This has really been a useful and, you know, enriching conversation. And I can see Abhijit has put for us some key takeaway messages from today's conversation. So the need to ensure that a gender lens is integrated across the entire spectrum. Because we are saying we need to have a gender responsive health system. But for us to do that, we need to interrogate the various population groups. And Dr. Shivangi mentioned a very critical point of the interconnectedness of the different spheres within the health, looking at the different population groups that we are working with, spanning from the youth, looking at the elderly population. We're also seeing how climate is also affecting the different gains that we have made so far. And Ma has just talked about how administrative data can also help shape some of these policies that we are really been investing ourselves in, in terms of time and money. And Margaret has spoke a lot around how the need for governments to empower community health volunteers. In some contexts, we call them community health workers, because you know this particular group of people still face challenges. In most of the countries, they are not recognized and remunerated for their work. So how do we empower them for them to be able to cover more space? And Dr. Shabnam had raised a very key point on how we need to champion for a future led by her, looking at health, equity, and rights. So we all have a role to play that even as we are looking forward to the meeting that will be convened in September this year, we as players really have a voice to play. And as CSOs, we have been told this, uh, this afternoon that we have a role to play in building as part of the coalition building, looking at the different population groups and being able to create a scenario where the social processes are also responsive. Dr. Elise spoke about how in Burkina Faso they've come up with a tax regime that is also, you know, basically looking at how finance is a barrier to access to services. So to us, really, it's been a delight having each of us join us today in our conversation and also hearing some of the insights in what is happening across the different spaces. And yes, in as much as we are spread around the globe, our learnings really help shape this conversation. And we are looking forward to being able to amplify the voices of young women and men, and also bringing in the marginalized groups into account for us to learn not only from the pandemic, but also determine what are those things that need to be prioritized and what are the conversations we need to carry forward 
So even as we call this session to an end, we are looking forward to us being able to share this recording and also just learning more from what the different actors are doing in this particular space. And we can't wait to hear some of the gains we will make going forward. So thank you so, so much for joining us this very day and wishing you a lovely day ahead, depending on the time zone you're joining us. And it's been a delight being your moderator today. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup à vous également. Le, fait, le plaisir you. est partagé. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Merci beaucoup. Bonne journée. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye.